Sarah, are we ready? I don't want to cut anybody off, but um, we're going to start. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'd like to call this meeting to order at 6.04. Good evening, everybody. If you could please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Um, Matt just told me that we do have one adjustment. Yes, I'd like... Yes, uh, we have a field trip that I'd like to add underneath superintendent's report to be H4 for that item. That field trip's happening later this week. Okay. Moving on, we have approval of minutes for Monday, May 1st, 2023 executive session at 430. May 1st, the budget workshop at 5.30. May 1st, the regular meeting at 6.30. And then May 9th, Monday, 2023 executive session, 1 p.m. Recommendation to approve the minutes as presented. Recommendation to approve the minutes as presented. Thank you, Jen. Seconded? I'll second. Thank you, Kelly. All in favor? All in favor. Public comments, I don't think we have anybody. Okay. I'm sure do, everybody's watching from home, though. Yeah, I do. Um, there is a nomination change that I want to also uh, change under um, this would be one second. Oh. Um, one second. Oh, under M, I'd like to move M, uh, our school nutrition program director, under that, under uh, to O, staff nominations, O2. That's more official. You're still all set. It's just more of a formality for that. Okay. All right. And then moving on, communications, nothing? Nope. All right, committee reports. We've got Sanford Performing Arts Committee update, SRTC Advisory Committee update, Special Education Advisory Committee update, and Curriculum Advisory Committee update. Melissa, do you want to go first? Put you on the spot. Yeah, absolutely. So the Sanford Performing Arts Center um, has met a couple of times since we've last uh, spoke to everybody, and I just wanted to give a quick little overview. Um, it is in the middle of the busiest stretch of the year. In fact, since April 1st, uh, SPAC has hosted a performance ceremony or rehearsal every single day except for Easter and Mother's Day. So they are super busy um, when you go in there. And many times there have been two or three events in one day. Um, so this will continue until June. Uh, last Tuesday, May 9th, Theater Works USA's national tour of The Lightning Thief stopped in Sanford. Over 1,300 children from grades 3 to 7 um, were able to attend that. Um, at, there's two different performances that they were able to attend. And then um, even students from Alfred Shapley, I mean, yeah, Shapley, Kenny Bunk, and Elliot uh, came in as well. Uh, the show had the added benefit of offering a literature tie-in to the popular Percy Jackson book series as well. Um, spring is dance season here in uh, Sanford, Maine. So with recitals and competitions every weekend, uh, this month they are hosting Jazz Tap and Dance Academy. Actually, that just happened this past weekend. Uh, dance Studio of Maine South, Dance House Productions, and World Class Talent Experience. And in June, they're bringing Northern Exposures in, Steppin' Out, and East Coast Dance uh, Complex. So our venue has become the most sought after space for dancing performances in Southern Maine, uh, with several thousands of families coming into the Sanford Performing Arts Center to see those dances. Um, and that is thanks to basically a, a good floor upgrade that we decided to do. Uh, there are uh, three performances remaining in our Spotlight series uh, this season. A special classical matinee presented by uh, DePonte String Quartet on Sunday, May 21st at 3 p.m. 
uh, the Portland Bach experience presented by Hayden's The Creation on Sunday, June 18th at 5 p.m. And of course, uh, Stratford Wind Symphony kicks off Independence Day weekend with their All-American Pop Show on Friday, June 30th at 7 p.m. Um, Brett would love to acknowledge his hardworking staff and crew. Uh, they work tire tirelessly to provide exceptional experiences for our audience, uh, our touring artists, our rental clients, um, and then following her studio recital this weekend, Kendra O'Connell from Jazz Tap and Dance Academy noted, what a phenomenal state of the art facility we get the opportunity to use for our shows, and the crew is the best around. Um, we also had a advisory committee uh, meeting and the committee looked back at our first five years uh, because believe it or not it's been five years and began planning for the next five the committee shared thoughts about the following three questions what are we getting right um, what are areas that we can improve upon and is there anything we're missing entirely so it was a great um, brainstorming session to make sure that our next five years are even better than the last and then at the SPAC committee meeting, the committee began reviewing applications to choose a scholarship recipient as well for our senior. That's it. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> That's a lot. Yeah. It's exciting to hear how busy we are and how much in demand we are. It is a beautiful facility. Okay, next in line is Amy Sivany, SRTC. Or well, yeah, yeah, I'll jump in. Uh, Amy can Amy can jump in as well, but uh, on Wednesday, May 3rd, uh, probably one of my favorite events of the school year is uh, the SRTC Advisory Committee, which makes up of our sending schools, school committee members, and uh, superintendent and central office personnel. We come to lunch at the SRTC restaurant, and uh, during lunch, uh, we're served by the students, and so we have a... a, a a great lunch and then after the lunch uh, this year we broke into by schools and so we had students Sanford students who attend SRTC who came to speak to Amy and I about their experiences at SRTC and it's just um, I know I really enjoy that we had um, I want to thank uh, Jaden Winchell Abby Lunny Val Putnam Francis Hagen and Madison Shepard they were the five Sanford students. They had a wide range of programs. We had early childhood, digital design, EMS, IT, student engineering and architectural design. So we had a wide range, but it was awesome to come back and be able to have a conversation with them about their experiences in terms of uh, working through SRTC um, for that. I don't know, Amy, if there's anything you want to add to that in terms of uh, being able to have that opportunity to speak with um, Stanford students. Um, I think it, it's amazing. This is my second time uh, meeting with the students at this luncheon, and it I, every year I wish I, I wish that everybody could get that opportunity, and maybe we can make it happen at some point, just because their sense of um, you know what I think we had asked like one what what do you love about it and they all said the sense of community within their um, their class and you know they were I think all but one because EM, EMS is just a one-year program the rest are two-year program and so the just the sense of community and the bonds that they've made and the connections they've made being together through junior and senior year and with kids from different schools um, just they just that just actually there was um, both two students that said that that was actually the reason that made them get up every morning to go to school was those connections and was their program so um, you know it, it was really it's amazing to hear yeah the, the panel we had as I said just the different trades that represented also in areas but uh, just the different they had uh, coming from a lot of different perspectives but very similar experiences in terms of uh, that sense of community that uh, Amy talked about that is able to be able to build that. And I think after they left, Amy and I were looking at each other saying, wow, that was, uh, we're really glad we got to be able to do that because it's so reaffirming. Uh, also just want to let people know that um, the Sanford Regional Technical Center recognition night is coming up. That'll be Wednesday, May 24th and that's gonna be taking place in our Partners Bank uh, Gymnasium. And uh, school committee is invited to that uh, 
recognition ceremony. We're looking forward to that. Okay, thank you, Amy. Special. Oh, oh Matt. <laughs> special education. Yeah, special <laughs> education advisory committee. Uh, we had our second meeting uh, last week, last Wednesday. The focus of that meeting was um, special education staffing, both the recruitment of new staff as well as the retaining of current staff. Uh, we were able to send out a survey to all of our special ed staff throughout the district uh, to help us um, co collect information to help us. Um, and we reviewed that and we also had good dialogue from that and uh, we're looking to use that information to create a, probably a staffing action plan that's going to result in some uh, short-term strategies as well as some others that probably are going to take some time. Uh, to look at, but I think that's going to be a takeaway that we're looking at, but uh, the discussion was, um, uh, we had good, good dialogue and good discussion from all the various stakeholders there uh, to be able to look at that. Um, Amy, Melissa, anything else that you want to add? You were both able to attend. Feel free to jump in if there's anything uh, more you want to say on that. The next Special Education Advisory Committee meeting is going to be Wednesday, May 24th, and that focus of that meeting is going to be more on the referral process that takes place at uh, throughout the district at all the various levels, elementary, middle, and high school. I would, I guess I would just say that I, I find um, it's been great. This is our second meeting. I think, you know, having everybody come to a round table um, discussion has been really good, getting different perceptions and just hearing from everybody um, from the different schools and different age groups has been great. Um, so I'm looking forward to it, this um, committee continuing. Okay, thank you. Did you grab me? Oh, Melissa, I'm sorry. Did you want to? I was just going to piggyback on that and just the, um, the, the efforts to, you know, maintain our special education and, you know, really the, their hearts are in it to, to make it work. So I was just very impressed. Yeah, reaffirming that, that our staffing challenges are really having an impact. Uh, that, th there's no doubt about that. And obviously we're looking at what we can do to address that. Obviously, um, funding is uh, increasing funding on that, and compensation is a big piece of that. But we're also looking at it holistically to say if there's some other things that we can be able to do. But when you're having those staffing challenges, that is just so impactful on all of our employees, uh, and that's something that um, is needs to be addressed. Well, then I'm going to add something too because I was at that meeting also. Um, <laughs> just uh, piggyback on what you said, Melissa, that there's everybody is so passionate about the special ed um, system that we have in place and just how wonderful the communication is and how open everybody is to suggestions and ideas. And it's just a great collaborative process. And I'm glad that I get a chance to just sort of be there and listen and learn. Okay, moving on, Curriculum Advisory Committee. Ms. Lambert. That would be me, hello everybody. So the Curriculum Committee met um, a week ago and it was our final meeting of the, of the school year, so I kind of went over everything that we've been working on in the um, Curriculum Office. So this was the second year that we've implemented Reveal Math in our grades six through 12. Um, so this year our training um, supported the new teachers that were here, but we also started digging deeper into the into the um, Alex program, which um, works in Reveal, works with Reveal, and helps remediate students, but also accelerate them if you've got students that um, need a little bit more of a challenge. It was our first year in our K to four. Uh, I'm sorry, K to five, um, and teachers and students. At first, it's always it's always a little struggle at the beginning when you're looking at something new, but um, just like we saw in the pilot teachers last year, about after the first of the year, the teachers are like, they're getting it. Like, this is amazing. Like, the language that they're using when talking about math is amazing. Um, so I'll be working with department chairs and grade level leaders and my math coach to um, identify um, professional development plans for next year so that we can make sure we get everybody's needs. 
um, the health of the person, the health, physical education, art, and music all had their standards updated by the Maine Department of Ed, their Maine Learning Results, or MLRs. So they spent um, several ERDs unpacking those and seeing, kind of cross-referencing them with the old ones, what's new, what's different, what's the same. Um, and a lot of it, the pieces are all still there, but the, the verbiage or the language has changed. So they just kind of oriented themselves to that. And then we began, after the first of the year, um, understanding how to create units. Um, it's called backwards design planning. Um, so that we can share some consistency across um, elementary schools to make sure that all of our health teachers are, are, and students are, are um, being exposed to the same content in similar ways with some opportunity you know, for them to differentiate or make it a little bit varied, um, as well as um, our health right up through middle school. So that will take into some next year. That is a very time-consuming process, but a very good process. So um, we will continue that work next year. Uh, the middle school science department, I met with them and they're reviewing their current units as well, as well as their common assessments to make sure that each, that their grade levels are aligned. So then again, students are getting the sim similar experiences, obviously with a little bit of um, wiggle room for teachers to kind of add their own flair. Um, and that process again will continue into um, next year. The, my big task this year was my literacy groups, um, kindergarten through eighth grade. So for the middle school grades five through eight, I met with the department, and again, their MLRs, or main, their standards, changed a little bit, so they did a crosswalk to see what's different, what's the same, and from there, they started identifying what their current, they started reflecting on their current curriculum, and where is it addressing the standards, where is it not, where is it addressing it well. So we're just trying to look to see if what we're currently doing is best practices for our students. Um, and then we'll continue that review next year and make a decision on where we might go. Um, and then kindergarten through fourth grade, I created a literacy committee um, to kind of go through the same process. We reviewed our standards and we looked at what makes a good literacy program in the elementary schools. It's very different from what it looks like at the middle and high school because you're teaching kids how to read. Um, so we just finished that, that last week, and we have recommendations that I'll be bringing to the elementary administrative about next steps on what they want to look at um, for our curriculum and where they want to go next year. Um, and then once we do that, then I'll bring it to the entire grade levels, K to four, for their feedback as well. Um, let's see, been working with Mr. Peterman, who you'll see a little later, um, for um, trying to implement uh, multi tiered systems of support at the high school, something that's um, been done for several years at the elementary. It's a more difficult process at the middle and high school because the schedules are so different and varied, um, but it's a project that he started in the fall with a small group and they've been working on it to um, hopefully start beginning the process next year. Um, and then we're also working with um, a small group of freshman teachers to identify curriculum needs for the freshman teaming coming up next year for that seminar class. Um, and then after the 23-24 school committee schedule is approved, the um, curriculum committee will meet to set quarterly meetings for next year and we'll make sure those are posted on the website. And that's my brief update. Any questions? No? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, we're moving on to superintendent reports. Sure, let's start with our student representative reports. We'll uh, kick it over to our team. Sure, uh, I can start us off. Uh, last Wednesday, the Elks uh, hosted their annual youth banquet. Uh, it was a great way to honor the top 50 at the high school as well as um, some eighth graders who earned junior teen of the year. Um, and then also on the note of middle school, tomorrow a few high school students uh, will be going to Sanford Middle School. Uh, to talk to incoming freshmen about their high school experiences, what they can expect, and all that good stuff. Um, and then this week uh, is the This Is Us event. I'll let Emma explain a little bit more about that. But um, we have spirit days each um, day this week, with today being country club versus country, uh, tomorrow being bikers versus surfers, uh, Wednesday being celebrities, and then Thursday is everything but a backpack day, and Friday being red and white day. Uh, Wednesday is the beginning of state testing, so sophomores and juniors will be enjoying a nice morning of state testing. Um, and then seniors have 12 regular school days left before finals are over and marching practice begins. 
Um, yeah, so I'll talk more about the This Is Us event. So it's run by peer helpers and it's sure to be a fun-filled event. Um, it will be filled with many activities ranging from dunking staff members in the dunk tank. Um, there will be karaoke in the Agora and then there will be also like many different foods that will be served at this event. And then all students will receive a word that represents them as a student. So um, the words will be hung on the class banners. And then also there are several clubs in the school that have been working hard to kind of make this event possible and make it a fun event for everyone involved. And then also next week, the National Honor Society Senior Send-Off will be held um, next Tuesday, the 23rd at 7 p.m. So this is held to say goodbye to all the seniors enrolled in the Honor Society and to show their support for their future endeavors. And then also uh, will be an opportunity to induct the new officers. So yeah. And then two weekends ago was prom, which was super exciting. Um, it went super well. We sold all of our tickets. Um, I think everybody had a really good night, which is awesome because it took a lot of effort to plan it. But I was just very happy with how it turned out. Um, and also some sports things today. Um, a little bit earlier, the girls lacrosse had their senior night, which they won, which is very exciting. Um, boys lacrosse has a game at Noble that's going on right now. Girls tennis is in Sanford, boys is at South Portland, and baseball is at Goodall. Those are all happening tomorrow. On Wednesday, the boys and girls team have their senior night here in Sanford. Um, softball has a game at Falmouth, and then boys lacrosse has a game at Noble. Baseball has a game at Goodall on Thursday, and girls tennis has a game or matches at Wyndham on Thursday. The boys are home. On Friday, softball has a game at Kenny Book. So, yeah. Thank you. Sanford Spotlight time. Continue. You're doing such a great job. Keep it going. Uh, this, uh, this edition uh, features SRTC sending five students to uh, Skills USA Nationals as the front page. Uh, SRTC has five students qualify for the Skills USA National Competition after they won their respective contests at the main championships in March. AJ Smith and Emily Bowden, Bowen, Bowen, or Bowen took the gold in the audio slash radio production team contest. Alexander Barth and Melody uh, Schaefer won in the 3D visualization and animation contest. And Caitlin, Caitlin Grog won in the technical drafting. Skills USA Nationals are next month in Atlanta. Check out the featured article for more. Uh, next, the Elks Junior Students of the Year. Sanford Middle School students Olivia Farrington and Jack Van Giesen, pictured above, were Sanford Middle School's, uh, with Sanford Middle School's assistant principals Mike Bailey and Principal Pam Leiden and Assistant Principal Joe Mastracchio, were honored on Wednesday, May 10th uh, at the Elks Club. These two students were chosen by the middle school staff and celebrated for their many accomplishments. Comments were made by their teachers and shared at the dinner and had a uh, consistent theme. Olivia and Jack, although stellar athletes, scholars, musicians, and theor uh, the theoretic, uh, theatrical. theatrical performances were, all, were above all kind and inspiring role models for their classmates and younger students. Uh, lastly, for my part, uh, Madison Shepard was named WNTW Scholar Athlete of the Week for the week of May 4th, so congratulations to Maddie Shepard. Um, I'm going to talk more about what's going on in the other schools. So first up, Sanford Middle School. Um, the seventh grade students enjoyed many activities and beautiful weather at uh, Lod Home Farms on Friday of last week and Monday, May 8th. So they were scavenger hunts and scientific observations to make and time to in the sunshine. So if you'd like to learn more about that, there's a little newsletter there and you can click it. And then also next up, Margaret Chase Smith. Um, so um, for the month of May, they'll be focusing on the theme of courage. So at their assembly, grade levels were challenged to get 25 positive yeah, <laughs> office referrals for the month of May. So students have been working hard and showing various acts of courage. So also, uh, once again, there's a newsletter um, if you want to learn more about that. And then at Pride Elementary on Friday, May 5th, um, they celebrated their amazing school nutrition professionals. So when they say school nutrition professionals are heroes, they mean it. That's why they celebrate them every spring um, with the annual school lunch hero day. So there's another link there. And then lastly at Carl J. Lamb, um, they had their career fair on Friday, May 12th. Uh, representatives from the local communities explained their positions and how schools can find interest in the school to match their careers. And then SHS alum Samantha Brink, who works for the um, 
MDOE helped set up for the event. So um, there's also a newsletter there. So if you'd like to learn more about that, um, yeah. And then moving on, at the Sanford Community Adult Education, uh, they're hosting a career exploration hiring event on May 15th. It will be from 1.30 to 3.30. They have local employers who are hiring employees either from sum summer employment or as a part of the main career exploration program. So the main career exploration program offers paid work opportunities for young people aged 16 to 24 um, um, to experience a career they might be potentially interested in to pay uh, internship. So if you're interested in that, um, you just attend the event. There's no registration necessary. And then lastly, for my part, uh, the Spartan Times, it was School Nurse Appreciation Day on May 10th this year, and Sanford High School wants to celebrate the efforts of our school nurse, Miss Lynn Signor. Signor has worked at the high school for seven years. She's a Sanford graduate, and her three children went through the Sanford school system. She's navigated SHS through a pandemic and has been friendly and familiar face to all students in Step Lake. So if you'd like to learn more about uh, Ms. Signor, there is a link to the Spartan Times article there. For this week's employee spotlight, it is the Sanford Middle School special education teacher, Jessica Allen. Um, she was the IEP coordinator for six years before she returned to the classroom this year. There's a few quotes from her um, in that little section. And then at the Sanford schools, um, the Finance Authority of Maine visited all of the grade four classrooms and completed an activity where the students got to um, identify what they liked and what they were good at in order to determine some potential careers for their future. Um, some announcements, the kindergarten registration is now open for the 2023-2024 school year. There's a link to see more information. And then the spring sports season is going. Um, there's a link for the practice schedules for the high school and also middle school sports. And then the last couple are just additional links for the City of Sanford, WSSR TV, the Sanford Athletics Instagram, and the Spartan Times online newspaper. Well done, thank you student representatives, nice job. I was able to attend the Carl J. Lamb Career Day last Friday, and let's just say that was awesome. Um, I really enjoyed that, that made my, uh, that made my week uh, an opportunity having a lot of our local people that Samantha Brink had set up to be able to come back and speak and have an opportunity to answer questions um, for that. That was outstanding. Uh, since our last school committee meeting on May 1st, uh, new immigrant families from Angola have arrived unexpectedly in the Sanford area. As families arrived, the general assistance office with the city worked to find temporary housing at the Sanford Inn, and they provided resources to help families meet their basic needs. Uh, for the school department, our outreach and ESOL staff immediately began the process of connecting with the families to welcome them to our community and to begin the registration process. Uh, quickly, we learned that the number of families coming to S Sanford was significant, and it required community collaboration. On Thursday, May 4th, a meeting was held with local agencies, city leaders, and school staff to coordinate resources and support. The meeting was productive in setting up roles and responsibilities of the different organizations. Uh, this group also met last Thursday, May 11th, is going to continue to meet weekly to coordinate resources. Uh, as a school department, our first goal is to register and screen the incoming students. So on Friday, May 5th, uh, we held a large registration event at Sanford High School, Sanford Regional Technical Center. In total that day, we, regist all, we registered all of those students who had arrived as of Thursday, May 4th, to the best of our knowledge. In total, 23 students were registered. The majority of these students uh, are non-English speaking with their primary language being Portuguese. A special thank you to everyone who was involved in welcoming the families and registering students uh, from the school department. That's everyone from um, Assistant Superintendent Steve Boussier, administration, outreach, ESLL teachers, classical language teachers, food service, and various others. It was truly amazing to see our staff pull together to make this happen. We had everything from uh, getting the facility ready to accommodate the families, um, the transportation being setting up. We had staff bake brownies and cookies for the families, just helping to communicate with the families, buying toiletries and coloring books. We had um, uh, to help the families taking them out to play into the gymnasium, feeding uh, the families and the students, and in some cases even finding shoes for some students. 
uh, unbelievable. Just amazing to see uh, how we've got our resources in, uh, set up to be able to come back and do that. Uh, kudos all the way around. We screened students um, last week to determine their level of need and to guide our placement. And so uh, last Tuesday, um, we had the key stakeholders in the school department met to continue that planning process to support a successful school entry plan for the students. So uh, currently we have placed students at Sanford High School, Sanford Middle School, and Margaret Chase Smith School to, prevent or, to better provide support for students. These 23 students started today, May 15th, at those three schools, and it uh, looks like all indications are things went really well um, for that. Last, um, on Friday, May 5th, and throughout that weekend, we did have additional families arrive to Sanford, and they were also placed at the Sanford Inn. So we had formed a planning team of um, uh, teachers, outreach staff, school counselors, a nurse, building administrators, community agencies, and central office staff. And so that group has been meeting and planning and coordinating all those moving parts um, that are involved, such as registration, screening, transportation, educational programming, and communication. Um, and we're going to continue to meet weekly to monitor this transition and problem solve any concerns that arise. Last Wednesday, um, our ESOL staff met with staff in those three schools that are receiving students to provide guidance on how to welcome and support the students. Uh, our goal over the last uh, remaining part of the school year is to focus to introduce the students to our school community and the routines and expectations of the school to provide safety, stability, and structure. Last Friday, May 12th, uh, we held our second large registration event uh, at the high school and the technical center uh, in the uh, technical center restaurant. In total, we registered all of the students who had arrived to Sanford, the best of our knowledge. That's 14 additional students were registered that last Friday, bringing our total number of students to 37. As mentioned, the majority of these students are non-English speaking, with their primary language being Portuguese. So I just can't thank our, uh, uh, our team and everyone who's involved in welcoming the families and registering the students. It was amazing to see how our staff pulled together to be able to make this happen. Um, we're looking to screen that second group uh, this week and uh, hoping to have a start time uh, for them um, sometime later this week for that. Just incredibly grateful for the, our uh, welcoming response of our staff and those who've been directly involved with that. Also wanted to add that uh, there are, uh, Sanford Community Adult Education is going to be offering um, some ESOL and MLL classes um, and those are going to be um, we're looking at later this month beginning May 23rd August 17th looking at Tuesday to Thursday uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays in the evening and so we'll be setting up some intakes in the uh, CASAS taking place later this month to conduct those assessments with um, our community adult education MLL uh, teachers and volunteers and the class will begin later this month and we're looking to do that in collaboration um, with uh, Curtis Lake Church helping us to be able to do that. So that's an update on the new immigration families coming to Sanford. What, what is the MLL and ASD and all that? ESOL is oh. English as secondary, uh, English as a second language. Yeah. And MLL is multi-language learner, okay. I think. <laughs> that sounds right. Okay, next is the 2023-24 budget referendum update. Sure, so budget referendum, the school budget, uh, will be going to referendum on Tuesday, June 13th. So we're starting to be able to um, prepare for that. This week, I will be um, attending the Kiwanis meeting on Wednesday, uh, the Rotary meeting on Thursday, to be able to uh, talk about the school budget pr and promote that and answer any questions that people have at those groups. I'll also be uh, a guest on uh, Chamber Talk, um, the Sanford Chamber of Commerce, Rick Stanley's 
um, radio show. I'll be a guest this weekend talking about the school budget and also planning to meet uh, at the Trafton Center later this month to also come to talk and promote that budget. And we've also, we're working on this week finalizing uh, information that we'll be able to send out to people in support of that budget uh, as well. So just a reminder, to, uh, Tuesday, June 13th is when the referendum is scheduled. And you can vote now. Yes, uh, thank you, Jen. The, um, is it this week it started? Yeah, it did start. It. I know uh, when, uh, when I talk with Kiwanis on Wednesday, Sue Cody is going to be there joining that because that's part of it, is also talking about early voting as well. So, yep. And then to add an item, uh, there was a field trip. Uh, it, this did um, come in late. Uh, we kind of had our wires crossed in terms of getting this information out. But uh, the, band, the uh, high school band and chorus all state um, uh, event is happening this weekend, uh, later this week on uh, Thursday and Friday, and uh, actually Wednesday, Thursday and Friday it looks like. And so we've got seven students who will be going up to that trick, uh, trip up to Umaine Orono, and that is an overnight with that as our students will be staying in the dorms uh, that are provided by the Maine Music Educator Association. Uh, with that. So that is going to be happening this Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. I want to wish um, our students being recognized. Best of luck. Okay. Thank you. Director's reports. Steve Boussier is going to talk to us about a whole lot of things. First to 10 grand, pre K update, vaping tobacco, work group update, and licensed drug and alcohol counselor search update. A lot. It's a lot, but I'll try to keep it brief. Um, the first item is a first 10 schools and communities grant opportunity through the Maine Department of Education. Um, this is a grant that is being offered to elementary schools across the state, um, and it is for one single elementary school. Um, and the school we are looking um, to apply for this grant is um, Sanford Pride Elementary School. I'll talk to you a little bit about what this grant entails. Um, first 10 schools and communities are partnerships between elementary schools, early childhood programs, and community partners that come together to work on improving teaching, learning, and care for young children and their families. First 10 schools and communities attend to the whole child development by providing consistent quality of services to all children and families, aligning resources and supports across the first 10 years of children's lives, and fostering smooth transitions at each um, stage of development. First, 10 schools and communities coordinate the transition to pre-K and kindergarten, conduct joint professional learning among early childhood educators, pre-K and elementary teachers, and align and improve early elementary grade curriculum and instruction, foster engagement of families and schools and community partners, provide play and learn groups linked to elementary schools, coordinate connections to health and social services, connect child care providers with elementary schools, and improve the quality of early childhood programs in the community and within the school department. Um, selected applicants, uh, the requirements will be that we will have to form a leadership team. The leadership team will consist of parents, teachers, administrators, CDS, Child Developmental Service, the folks that deliver special education for four-year-olds. Head Start and other community agencies. Um, we will have to hire an outreach coordinator who will oversee the implementation of the first 10 grant, which is for three years, um, and commit to maintain collaborative relationships to ensure that the teams can effectively carry out their plans and achieve their goals uh, for children and families. As we look at our pre-K implementation, um, I see this opportunity is um, it's a good time for us because I feel like we've implemented pre-K very well within our school. But when I look at the relationship that we have with our child care providers, with CDS, um, with other community organizations that support students, we're fragmented. And so this, I see this as an opportunity to help pull us all together. Um, in terms of what the funds would be, in the first year it's 125000 
The second year is 75,000, and the third year would be 30,000. And so those are decreasing funds. They would pay for the position of the outreach worker um, in year one, some of that salary in year two, and less of that in year three. Um, would also pay for professional development opportunities for our teachers and our early child care providers in the community. Um, and it would provide for um, any type of family engagements we have. We would also pay for that type of stuff. Um, sustainability. So one of the first things when we apply for grants is, well, what's the sustainability to this? The grants funds go away. We're going to be left high and dry. I see this as an opportunity where this person would come in and help us build the systems. Um, and then I see that our outreach and admin would help continue this system. And so I see we have in Sanford, I think we're fortunate because we have an out outreach worker at the elementary level that I think this would tie in nicely to that. So that's where I see the sustainability um, coming up. So I think it's a good opportunity. Um, it is a competitive grant um, in terms of what it is asking for in terms of the application. A lot of that work has already been done when we applied for our pre-K grant. I do have a meeting tomorrow morning with our community providers, CDS, Head Start, the YMCA, um, school admin and teachers, just to talk to them a little bit more about some of the dates that are involved that are going to be required over the summer. Um, and if that's a go, we're going to put it together and, and get it done by the end of the week. Uh, for the for the guy that's when the due date is um, what was I going to say it is a competitive grant um, our free and reduced lunch numbers are in our favor um, but there are other districts that have higher free and reduced lunch numbers than we have and the other piece of it is this is really a grant meant for rural communities and so rural communities will have a higher score than we we have there are other communities in the state of Maine that have this grant, um, just two, um, Lewiston, Old Orchard Beach. Um, those are two communities that stood out to me um, that have this grant. So I see it as a good opportunity um, to see what happens. Any questions? Um, talk a little bit about incoming pre-K. I've broken up pre-K into incoming and those that are moving on. Um, Incoming pre-K, the applications are due this Friday. We have about half of those enrollments back. Um, so that's right on track. You did it last week, they come in fast and furious. Um, once Friday passes, we'll be reaching out to all those families that did not return their application. And at that time, if we have slots, we'll be inviting those folks that are on the wait list. Um, one of the areas that we look to improve upon this year uh, from last year is how are we transitioning families in? Um, to our pre-K programs and so we're adding a new strategy of having an informational night for incoming pre-K families. Um, the school principals and the teachers have been working on a presentation um, to do with those folks and Dale and I um, and Michelle over at SRTC will be running that show um, and our goal is really to welcome families and to answer any questions they may have. Um, a lot of times throughout the summer we had questions, they'd email me or they call, you know, what about this, what about that, what does screening look like? And so it's just really to alleviate some of those concerns and to answer any questions parents may have. The staff did a nice job putting a video together that was sent in your week, weekly update for uh, the school committee. Please don't share that, it's, it's, it's not prime time, we got to show it to our parents first, but I think it really, um, it was good. Put a smile to my face at the end of the Could week. be the best seven minutes of your week, yeah. just saying. Um, in terms of wrapping up pre-K, we are fast in, in approaching the end of pre-K. Um, we did send a parent, I had talked about sending a parent survey out to parents. We did send a parent survey out asking them for feedback in regards to their child experiences um, with that. Um, we're going to take that information and use it um, as well as our own assessment to set goals for the coming year and to conduct the DOE uh, end of the year performance report, which we're looking forward to um, with that. They also, um, one of the strategies we're adding there, they're also going to do an incoming kindergarten night for those pre-K families as well. Um, we do have some pre-K families that are going to be new um, because they were at SRTC and now they're coming over to one of our schools or they were at Head Start. And so we added this strategy. And for those folks, those kindergarten parents that were never in our schools, 
and so they're they're piggybacking it off from the the pre-k night so thank you to the building admin and the teachers um, who are working on making that happen our tobacco vape work group we did meet um, since our last school committee meeting uh, the purpose of the committee is to review our current approach to tobacco and vape education prevention and intervention to identify what's working what's not working and what are some possible steps we can address for student use um, the meeting was very well attended um, you can tell uh, the topic is hot when you um, schedule a meeting in May after school and we have a strong turnout um, we had a strong turnout of folks um, we had administrators school counselors school committee members school nurses and we also had staff from Southern Maine Healthcare. It was a productive meeting where we brainstormed answers to the questions posed above. And our next meeting is next Tuesday, um, May 23rd, here at City Hall Chambers at 2.30. And we're really, really we're going to work on putting together an action plan and next steps for that. To piggyback off that, uh, just an update on the li licensed drug and alcohol counselor position, which is a grant-funded position. Um, we've advertised twice. Um, we had three applicants. Um, we did some interviews. A couple of folks didn't show, and the one person that was a potential um, hath, has withdrawn um, after she learned a little bit more about the position. Uh, we have reposted. I do have another applicant that appeared um, this afternoon in my email, and if we don't get a good response, we're going to be reaching out to the universities um, to see if you have any recent graduates that may be a good fit. So that's all I had for you until I get to policies this evening. Any questions? Any questions from anybody? Thank you. Okay. Ms. Lambert, summer programming update. My turn again. Um, so summer programming is kind of twofold. I focus on students as well as staff um, enrichment. So for the summer programming for students this year, uh, Mr. Belfay and um, is offering his middle school drama camp again, and that's the week of July 10th through 13th. Um, that Thursday, they'll have like a 20-minute um, production of what they've been working on throughout the, throughout the week, and they'll also record it for parents who aren't able to attend, so they'll be able to see it. Um, SRTC is working on finalizing their programs interested in offering um, a summer enrichment. I think um, Kathy had said that they would probably only offer it one week. They did it two weeks in the past couple of years because we get out so early, so they did just Sanford and then, so I think that they're just going to combine them this year. Um, and then I'm looking for some teachers, and I have some wonderful teachers that have reached out to me to offer some middle school um, enrichment activities. So four weeks starting the week of July 10th with the final week starting July 31st. Um, we want to run um, an enrichment camp of sorts, four days a week with uh, Monday through Thursday, with Thursday um, ending the learning, the theme of the week with a um, field trip of some kind. Um, and as a, an idea that I shared with them or um, an example, if you're learning about lobstering, you can talk about the weather, you can talk about the science behind it, you can incorporate math, the history of it, and then, believe it or not, you can charter a lobster boat and go lobstering um, right out of Portland. So that was just kind of an idea that I, that I threw out to kind of get them thinking outside of the box. Let's really do something engaging. So I had some teachers reach out to me that they were very interested in it, so I'll be talking with them this week and we'll start finalizing some plans. And then, um, like I have done the past couple of years, I'll do another summer brochure to give families um, ideas of activities to do inside, outside, um, online. There's some great websites where you can go and visit zoos and aquariums and stuff right from the computer, it's very cool. Um, and then what's going on in our community, and I'll work with Sam Bonzi to have him um, push that out at least once or twice a month during the summer to give families um, ideas of what they can do. So that's my student piece, and the summer um, piece for staff, we're gonna look a little different this year. I've been working with a group of York County um, school districts, uh, Marshwood, York, Old Orchard Beach, there's somebody else in there, I can't remember, I apologize. To, to work on um, a kind of a regional professional development plan. So each district sent out um, a survey to staff asking them, would you prefer to have um, professional development during the summer, after school, during the school year, and then what areas would you like professional development in? Um, Sanford was pretty close to 50-50, but it leaned a little more towards um, offering professional development during the school year after school. 
Um, but we are still going to offer a few things this summer. Um, so together, we're offering mentor training, a responsive classroom um, elementary core course, which is basically, um, it really focuses around social emotional learning. Um, understanding the cycle of disruptive behaviors, which Stacey Bissell will be um, presenting for us. She does an amazing job. And this is open to anybody in any of these school districts as well as others that can come and join. Um, Kevin Way, one of our high school health and PE teachers, is offering a CPR training for any staff that's interested. There's um, professional learning communities facilitator training. And then I will always offer a few book groups because I am an English teacher at heart, so you do need to do that. Um, and then it was interesting, we all brought together what were the top five um, professional development that staff wanted, and it was very similar across all of the districts. So student motivation and engagement, um, social emotional learning, trauma-informed teaching, executive functioning, functioning and classroom management were the top um, areas that staff in the multiple districts said that they were interested in. Um, and that's it, that's what we have for summer so far. Any questions? That's all. That's it. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks. Moving on to new business. Yes, we have, we've been invited to a pretty uh, interesting and awesome opportunity. So I'd like to um, invite our uh, band, Sanford High School Band Director Haley Francor and our high school principal Matt Peterman to please come forward to talk about uh, this opportunity. All right. Hello. Um, to give you a little bit of background here, uh, I received a letter in the fall. I get a ton of letters um, from a ton of different places all around the world inviting our band to crazy spectacular things, but they're usually some type of scam that wants us to pay a ton of money for, for no real reason. But this letter in particular caught my eye um, because it had requested us to be the only band uh, to represent the state of Maine uh, in the 2026 Salute to America Parade. Um, and this is a parade that takes place in Philadelphia on America's 250th birthday. Um, and again, we were selected as the only band in the state of Maine to be invited to this um, as they put it together. So. Uh, here's just a little information and background where and when. Um, we're looking far ahead into the future here uh, to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, July 2nd through July 5th in 2026. So a little ways away, but can't hurt to plan ahead, right? Um, and just a little map there, just in case you were curious and how, how far everything was. Um, there it is. Um, I won't read all of this, but just a little bit about the parade. This happens every year. Um, but essentially this parade walks you through uh, just the, the cycle of America and it walks you through the very beginning um, with the Civil War and kind of brings you up to present day and does that through floats and parades uh, with drum corps and different schools and all kinds of things. Um, but they're looking to do kind of a, a giant celebration for obviously America's 250th birthday, which I think the big word is semi-quincentennial. I'm um, probably not saying that correctly, but it's, it's a very long word. Um, but again, just a lot of stuff, and it starts off um, kind of on the outskirts of town and then leads you through the historic district where you end up um, in the center of kind of where everything began in Philadelphia. Um, so who is looking to go on this trip? Um, this would be for incoming Sanford High School students um, 9th through 12th grade, um, and these would be students in concert band, wind ensemble, or marching band. Um, this would include eighth graders who participated in the marching band for the 2025 season, um, but not eighth graders that would be entering only concert band in the fall of 2026, so after the parade would happen. Um, we do currently have uh, Sanford Middle School students in our marching band. We have some advanced seventh graders um, and some eighth graders, so this isn't out of the ordinary that eighth graders are interacting um, with high school students. It would just make sense that if they're invested in the program already and we're about to do um, a parade that they would be able to join in on this. Um, so they would already be familiar with a lot of those high schoolers that they would be joining and of course they'd be becoming a high schooler that fall. Um, and this again, only Sanford High School students. I know we do have a contingency of students currently um, that don't attend Sanford High School and attend uh, Massabesic, Kennebunk and schools around us. This would only be for Sanford High School students, none of those uh, other schools. 
Um, currently looking at numbers themselves. Um, I just put kind of our current numbers, what we're looking at uh, for next year and what I, what I project for 2026, but it, it's obviously hard to project that far out. Um, but uh, looking at the middle school currently, I put the class of uh, 2027, class of 2028, 2029, and 2030, which is kind of crazy to look at there. Um, but if you look at those middle school numbers, that is a total of 218 students. Um, and I'm anticipating about 75 of those students to want to go on this trip in 2026, um, if not more of that. Um, so currently, our numbers have been on the rise every single year. I believe my first year uh, that I got here, concert band was around 25 students, um, and we're sitting uh, pretty well right now. So I anticipate 2026, we're going to be in even better shape. Um, so that just kind of gives you a projective outline. I'm thinking 50 to 75 uh, students in marching band. Obviously, there's some overlap in some of these here with concert band. I'm anticipating 75, um, wind ensemble 35, but again, some of those kids might be mixed into all three of those groups. Um, this is the tentative itinerary, so the packet that was handed out to committee members there. Um, I reached out to a travel consultant company. I reached out to a couple. Um, the one that you have in front of you is the one that I found to be the best. Um, they gave us the lowest price. They were very responsive. They have a lot of really good reviews, um, and you can find kind of some of their affiliations in the back. Um, but they made a customized itinerary for us, um, and I had them updated a couple times as well. The first version included a cruise around Philadelphia, which was fancy, but not really for the price tag that it came with. Um, so I kind of, I had them bump it down a little bit for us. Um, so on July 2nd, we would depart uh, for Philly. We would just get some lunch on the way, arrive at the hotel, and just have a night in at the hotel with a pizza party and a pool party, get to know each other, hang out. Um, the next day would be kind of the big history day. Um, so travel into the city, go to Love Park, Independence Hall, Liberty Bell Center, um, lunch at the Bourse, which has a bunch of different restaurants in it so kids could choose. There's a variety. Um, and then the Museum of American Revolution and, of course, a baseball game. What more American thing to do in Philadelphia? Um, and then July 4th would be the big day, um, probably pretty early depart for the parade route. Uh, do the parade, and then after the parade, um, this is like a big celebration. I think it, it's either 16 or 14 days that leads up to the 4th of July. Um, so this is kind of a big celebration afterwards. So doing lunch at the Hard Rock, and then having students be able to go enjoy the party afterwards. Um, they have a lot of different vendors, um, obviously a lot of historical stuff going on. Um, and then there's always a free major uh, concert at the... Uh, very end, right before the fireworks. I think last year was Jason Derulo, and that was just kind of a regular old year. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking for the 250th birthday, it would probably be quite a major artist that these kids would be able to see, and it's, it's totally free. Um, Bruce Springsteen, okay, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, sure th I'm sure they'll ask. Um, <laughs> And then the 4th of July, so of course fireworks. Um, so that would just kind of be their typical 4th of July day. Um, and then the next morning, July 5th, probably a, a little sleep in a little bit there, but depart uh, back to Sanford, lunch on the way, um, and arrive back to Sanford. And that's, again, that's all outlined in the itinerary there as well. And it kind of lays out some budgets for uh, meals as well, um, which I thought was very helpful. Um, so looking at the potential cost of all of this um, from this company, and you can find that um, a couple pages after the itinerary, um, it's looking to be with this itinerary about $718 per student, um, but this cost includes all meals, hotel, um, admission to all of these events, everything is taken care of ahead of time, plus they provide a tour manager, so if there's any issues along the way, if I have any questions, if any chaperones have any questions, they take care of all of it, they take care of all of the gratuity towards anything that we do. Um, and then they, of course, take care of all the coach buses. So there's nothing that has to be done financially by myself or any of the students while we're on the trip. That's all included um, per person. And there is a payment plan that you can see. Um, this is, uh, the dates say 2023. They can't plan uh, ahead so far to 2026. So I asked them to do something for a trip that would take place in 2024. Um, so that's why you see some of those different dates. Um, but it also shows just some different passengers um, and room assignments. But the cheapest option would be if we had 100 passengers, 
um, doing quad rooms, so four kids per room, um, for $718. Um, so again, that was the best cost that I could find. Another company that I went through, I believe it was about $950 per student, um, and then I had started to go through and tried to price things through myself, and that was a lot for me, um, and I got really scared, and I also came very close um, to the price that was quoted at the 950. It was going to cost more from what I was doing. Um, this consultant company also works directly with the producer of this parade, um, so they know the guy very well. They've done this event before. They've done this uh, with schools many, many times, um, and then it, it'll lay out all the inclusions and everything that you see in front of you. Um, obviously, that's a large cost, um, so just some potential ways that uh, we could fundraise or work through this, um, so that way students aren't fully responsible for this. Um, we do our raffle calendar every year with the Sanford Music Boosters. That's a full music department uh, fundraiser that we do, um, but every year that draws in over $10,000, um, so I'm sure that if we had a purpose um, behind the calendar as well, we could do even more, um, but I know on our off years, we we make quite a good amount of money on it. Um, restaurant nights, I'm sure you've all seen doing local restaurants um, where they donate a portion of their sales to the band for one night or to any group. Um, that would be an option, of course. Um, the picture that you see there, I think, is the 2006, 2007 band as they were preparing to go to New York City um, for the St. Patrick's Day Parade. I think that they partnered with um, one of the local legions and they did a pancake breakfast at Applebee's. So I found that when I was digging through some history stuff, which I thought was interesting to include. Um, a marchathon, which we've never done anything like that in Sanford, but other schools have raised over $12,000 by just marching through their town and their neighborhood, um, and students get sponsored by family members, by friends, um, and that kind of raises a great deal of support, and they can go through neighborhoods, practice the parade tune that they're about to go play in Philadelphia, and kind of get a nice little send-off from their community before they, uh, before they leave. And other things would be a benefit concert, so just one of our regular concerts, but turning it more into a fundraiser um, for our trip, hosting a drum corps show, um, doing a mini golf tournament, or working a uh, concession booth at the Cross Insurance Arena uh, with any of our students and partnering with our music boosters again and any of our um, chaperones and parents. Um, safety, of course. Um, just looking ahead to the trip and how to keep it safe. Um, having an administrator on the trip or multiple administrators would be ideal. Um, using Remind, Band, or a communication app provided by a travel company. This travel company in particular, they have their own travel app um, that is all connected to just the people that are going on this trip. So every student would have that on their phone plus the chaperone leaders. Quick, easy way to communicate. Nobody has to share any phone numbers. Nobody has to worry about anything like that. Um, keeping things small, so one chaperone per every five to eight kids. Uh, I believe the district policy is 15 uh, students to one adult, so keeping it a little bit smaller than that to make sure you know we're in a place where we're not familiar, so more adults. Um, having mandatory trip meetings prior to departure, similar to SHS abroad, so reviewing school policies, types of problems that might arise, the itinerary, emergency procedures, hotel procedures, et cetera, things like that. Again, this travel company has their own uh, procedures for all of that, so they kind of take care of all of that, um, and they have their own set way that they would help us uh, facilitate those, and of course doing a bag check at Sanford High School prior to leaving. Um, going uh, off of previous Sanford Band trips, um, the Sanford Band is not uh, a stranger to doing any big trips, um, so in 2009 uh, the Sanford High School Band actually performed in President Obama's inauguration. Um, and they did not know, I believe, from what I could tell, they did not know that they were performing in the inauguration until early December of 2008, and they went to the inauguration mid-December of 2009. And from what I can tell, they raised $25,000 in one month to make it down there, um, which is quite unbelievable. I found all the itinerary, I found a list of donors, um, and just the, the photo albums and all the memories that I see, it's crazy. Um, when people find out that I teach at Sanford, other band directors are always asking me about the inauguration, and I'm like, I was 12, but I sounds, <laughs> it looked like it was a great trip. So um, if you didn't know that, next time you're at Sanford High School, take a look in the trophy case. Um, we have the framed letters that were signed by President Obama and now President Biden in there, um, and all the photos, and these are just some uh, clips from when they went. Um, and then they also marched in the 2007 New York City St. Patrick's Day Parade. I couldn't find a ton of information on that, but again, there's a lot of photos, a lot of memories that also gets brought up. 
They've done countless New England uh, marching band uh, competitions and things like that. So the band is certainly no stranger uh, to going on big trips. Um, just how this will help the Sanford School community in general, um, bringing Sanford to a national stage, um, obviously being in Philadelphia on America's 250th birthday is going to be quite a special moment, and to have Sanford, Maine there to represent the, represent the state of Maine is a pretty big deal. Um, and that, of course, is going to enhance the pride of our community that I know we all feel, and I know that all of our students feel, but to, again, just to be there and to be able to say that we did that, and, and we're that band, and we're that... Uh, city from our state. Um, students are going to receive recognition statewide and nationally, um, and I know that all of our students have been working very hard, and again, I think we're just deserving of that. Um, and building our middle school and high school programs, I think um, with mentioning this trip and this being something that students can look forward to in 2026, those 218 students that are enrolled in the middle school in our band program right now, I think that we're going to see a lot of carryover to the high school that's going to continue that momentum and that growth to our band programs. Um, and then just continuing the momentum of the growing performing arts community in Sanford. Um, we already heard a lot about that tonight, and I, I think it gets brought up a lot. And something that I know I'm really proud of, and I'm sure you all are too, so to bring this again to that national stage and to be able to have this to, to look forward to and, and to have to do is just uh, fantastic. Um, and then finally, just some other concerns to try to answer any questions. At this time, I don't project any equipment needs other than a new banner for this parade. We just got new uniforms. We just got new drums. Um, our regular budget already covers maintenance and repairs of all of our regular instruments. A new banner costs a couple hundred bucks, and we can figure that out quite easily, I think. Um, and then affordability for our students. Obviously, this is a really large trip, um, and our community supports the arts, and I'm very confident that with three years' notice, we can fundraise most of the cost of this trip. Um, and I don't plan to turn any student away for any financial reasons. Um, I never want to do that to any student. So I think that, again, with this much time um, and planning that we can do, I don't think any student will get left behind financially. And I, I think that we can easily do this and not put any stress on any students or the community at all. So if I can answer any questions, I'd be happy to. Any questions? Can you put me on the list for chaperone, please? <laughs> I'll start making my list. <laughs> any questions or comments or anything? I no? just, I, I just, you know, thank you for organizing this because it's a lot of work. Um, and I, I, you know, thank you for taking it on. And I'm excited that that we know that we have you. Those years. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. Yeah, you're really stuck now. No, you know what I mean? I'm invested. I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm ready to go. <laughs> Thank you. This is exciting for the students and um, for the community. And um, didn't you go on one of those trips as a student? I did. So our high school, um, our dance team and the band was invited for one of the 4th of July um, celebrations in Philadelphia. And it was amazing. It was awesome. amazing, oh. amazing. So when I heard about this, and we've talked about it, um, just so excited. Yeah, I think it's a oh, great, great, great experience for the students, just to, um, for the community in general. I think it's wonderful. So thank you, and thank you for doing all of this. And absolutely, I mean, after being with Kelly and seeing the um, going to Italy and seeing all the work that she put into that in the entire year and just everything from the chaperones to the small rules to the big rules to the traveling to everything. I mean, it's, it's a huge endeavor, so thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. may I make a recommendation? To allow the Sanford Marching Band Music Program to participate in the semi quincentennial Salute to American Independence Day Parade, <laughs> July 4th, 2026, in Philadelphia. I'll second it. All in favor? All in favor. Yay. Thank you guys very much. Yay. Congratulations. And Haley, probably as it gets closer, probably coming back another time to report back out to the school committee to give us an update and all that would probably be uh, nice. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now we're going to hear from Kelly Foley. 2025 Travel Abroad. Got all sorts of exciting things happening in our district. The 
sorry you have to sit through another slideshow, but I wrote everything down so that I don't get caught rambling, so I will attempt um, to keep it brief. Uh, my name is Kelly Foley. I'm a teacher and coach at Sanford High School, still literally in my coaching gear from a game earlier this evening, um, but I'm also the advisor of the SHS Travel Abroad Program. For those who may have not heard of us, in 2021, we officially launched our program that plans to offer one travel abroad opportunity per year to the senior class during their February vacations when the least amount of extracurricular activities are occurring or there's more flexibility there. We are partnered with um, EF Educational Tours. EF stands for Education First. Um, it's a Massachusetts-based company, uh, Massachusetts-based educational travel company that has been in the business for almost 60 years. Um, our first official trip took place this past February when we took 72 travelers abroad, 49 students, 13 parents, and 10 chaperones to Venice, Florence, and Rome, Italy. We brought everybody back. I'll just say that right now in case there's any like suspense. We got everybody back. Um, as an English teacher, I do struggle to find the words that adequately describe uh, our adventure, and we don't have the time for it really if I attempted, um, but I can say it was an experience that I think each traveler, each chaperone, each adult um, will remember for their lifetime. As discussed with the committee this past fall when I was here for the approval of the 2024 location, um, I'm returning now with a recap of how that trip went, um, and I'm very eager and excited to share it with you all, and I'm also here afterward to seek approval for the confidential, hint, hint, I'm gonna make sure I say that like six times, confidential location for the class of 2025. Um, let me make sure I'm switching the slides here. I hope to briefly introduce or reintroduce again SHS Abroad's vision and mission, provide a photo recap of our trip, share some stats, some feedback we've received, goals that we have for the future. So again, I'm Kelly Foley, uh, the SHS Abroad group leader and advisor of the program, um, and I have appointed and begged um, SHS Administrative Assistant Cynthia Pattershall in assisting me as head chaperone. So we've worked really closely over the past year um, to build Italy and we continue working together to build our Greece trip for the class of 2024. Um, back in January, we attended a four day double bus simulation tour to prepare us for this Italy trip. And I'm so thankful that we were able to get approval and go because it was the most realistic, fantastic preparation that helped us learn a lot of lessons ahead of time so we didn't have to learn them the hard way. Um, also previously mentioned, again, SHS Abroad is a newly launched program at Sanford High. We hope to provide annual travel abroad opportunities to members of the senior class. In partnership with EF Education First, we look to grow our students' independence and their curiosity to explore new places across the globe. Each class is presented with the destination in the beginning of their junior year so that they allow 16 or so months of payments and fundraising to make that trip happen. And ultimately our mission is to help students see themselves as global citizens, gain confidence and independence, and to experience new cultures. Our timeline from a very basic sense um, is that we reveal the location to each class again the fall of their junior year and we provide a parent information night in the evening, a week or two later for them to attend for all of the like nitty gritty details. Um, our, once students are signed up for the trip, we then begin organizing fundraisers and we host in-person meetings during Spartan time to prepare for the trip. These meetings become much more regular as the, the departure date nears. Um, and then we travel over February vacation. Once we've all caught up on sleep after the trip a few weeks later, then we all meet and follow up with feedback and, and sharing photos and stuff like that. So uh, the itinerary review of the trip, we basically uh, spent eight straight days uh, traveling. Our trip consisted of three main cities, Venice, Florence, and Rome. And we had small day visits and trips to Verona, Pisa, Assisi, and Pompeii. Um, in Verona, after a very long day of travel, our crew pushed through fatigue as we walked through the streets, a beautiful city famous for being the setting of Shakespeare's love story, Romeo and Juliet. And I think as we walked through these, uh, these streets, it started to kind of hit us that we're not in Sanford anymore. Um, but we were also so deliriously tired and hungry and I don't even know that it was just like, it, it was setting in but it hadn't and it was just a very fun experience to watch the faces kind of realize exactly where we were and what was happening. Uh, 
The Venetian islands of Murano and Burano, which we went to next, were absolutely fantastic. We spent our morning watching a glass blowing demonstration in Murano, followed by lots of shopping for incredible handmade glass goods. I think that's where our travelers got some of their gifts to bring home. Uh, we then traveled to the island of Burano, which is a photographer and cover, color lover's paradise. As you can see, we had kind of a fun challenge where each student or traveler was tasked with trying to find a house that matched the outfit they were wearing, which was pretty fun. Um, but this spot was easily a traveler top favorite based on the feedback that we received. We spent the second half of the day, because that was just the morning, spent the second half of the day in Venice where we took a guided walking tour around St. Mark's Square and the Doge's Palace. We were fortunate enough, but it was also a little crazy chaotic, um, to catch part of Carnival, which was a grand celebration with incredible color, costumes, confetti. Um, we rode the famous gondolas, ate lots of gelato, and enjoyed the stunning sun sunset. We then traveled to Florence, which is a city referred to as an open air museum for its abundance of beautiful sculptures, architecture, and more. We took a guided tour throughout the city, visiting sites like the Ponte Vecchio, the Gates of Paradise, and so many more that I just refuse to butcher the pr pronunciation on. Um, we also attended a leather demonstration. Florence is known across Europe for its high quality products. We shopped during free time. We continued to sample lots and lots of gelato flavors. Um, we marveled at the famous Duomo and the breathtaking views of a city with such rich history. The following day, 53 of our 72 travels, travelers went to uh, explore Pisa while the rest of the crew hung back in Florence um, to explore museums, the bell tower and more. We all ended the evening back together with free time in Florence and we had a dinner together in one of the city's most famous plazas. On our transfer to Rome, which was a pretty big drive, they kept that in mind and they broke it in half by allowing us to stop in the hilltop town of Assisi, which was the home of St. Francis, whose pledge to poverty inspired peace and love during the Middle Ages. Our tour guide loved to do the like peace and love, peace and love throughout the city, um, which was really fun. Uh, we had uh, guided tours of the two churches that are located in the top of the hill. Um, one was for death, one was for life. We took in these breathtaking views. Um, it was a perfect way to split up a day of travel and honestly, one of the feedback we received and shared with EF is how much more time the kids wish we could have had here because it was truly fantastic. Our first full day in Rome was filled with walking tours and I say that because our feet were sore. Um, we started the morning in Vatican City, soaking up the incredible marble statues, the art, the architecture. We were blown away by the talent and the ability to create such beauty from a time that it doesn't even seem physically possible. I think most of us had our jaws on the floor, the minds were blown. Like, I just think that as everywhere you turned, it was just like, we were speechless, truth, truthfully. Um, after that, we toured the Roman Forum and the Colosseum. We finished the evening continuing with our walking by strolling through some of Rome's most favorite spots. So we saw the Spanish Steps, Trevi Fountain, Pantheon, Piazza Navona. By the end of the day, we averaged 18 to 20,000 steps. Um, which adds up to eight to nine miles. Um, we were so sore and tired, but I think the awe of the city's undeniable beauty made it all worth it. And on our final day, the majority of our group traveled to Pompeii. Both Pompeii and Pisa were optional excursions um, that kids could add on. And we saw the famous ruins of a Roman city buried under ash after the catastrophic, catastrophic eruption of Mount Vesuvius. We were able to tour the preserved historical site of the ruins, the streets, the houses, um, and the life to see how this once thriving and sophisticated city lived. Uh, we had 10 amazing chaperones on this trip that kept our ratio as close to six to one as possible, which is the EF um, recommendation. And I cannot thank these chaperones enough for all their hard work. Um, I think at first glance, folks might see this as a vacation for these chaperones, but I can assure you it's exhausting. It's 24-7 care and energy from these lovely folks you see on screen. Um, we did not get a lot of sleep. We certainly felt the stress, but I think we all agreed it was a great experience and it was worth every minute of it. Some statistics that are kind of fun or interesting I'd like to share, um, including the physical challenges. Again, we spent approximately 15 hours or so on planes, 20 or more, probably more on buses. We walked anywhere from 90 to 105,000 steps and hundreds, maybe thousands of photos were taken. 
86% of students on this trip took advantage of our fundraising opportunities or the, and or the EF personal donation page, which um, when you sign up for the trip, you basically get your own personal like GoFundMe page and you can send it out to relatives and 100% of it goes right to, right to the student pocket. EF doesn't take a cut of it or anything. 17% um, of students paid for this trip on their own. 38 said that parents or guardians helped pay for the trip or paid for the trip and then 40% said that it was a mix of both. Um, so we're gonna continue to find ways to help our students and our families fundraise for this trip, but we also hope that the power of tradition and excitement um, leading up to this trip also encourages students to work and begin saving money as soon as they're able to enter high school and get themselves a job. Um, I did just wanna share a couple of testimonials. I had a, a survey go out to our students and we kind of all sat down and, and went through it together and we rated each location um, for the trip, but I also asked for a lot of feedback about the process that SHS Abroad went through. Um, I think we had a lot of positive feedback from this trip and some really helpful constructive feedback on how we can continue improving our system and overall traveler experience. We've already begun applying some of this feedback to our 2024 travelers who are heading to Greece. Um, so I did just want to put a little shameless plug of our Instagram and our Facebook pages for anyone that wants to go back and review more photos or track our trip. Um, I appreciate you allowing me the time to share this with you. Again, I tried to keep it pretty brief because I do have a second task on this agenda. Um, but I did want to share before I get to that that EF has proven to be a fantastic partner in this undertaking, as we just discussed um, with Haley's, is this is not something that one person can feasibly do alone. Um, their logistical strengths at EF include a peace of mind traveler policy that um, provides flexibility in uncertain times. They allow monthly or manual payment options that make these opportunities a little more financially accessible. We receive 24 seven emergency support, liability insurance and more. Um, and even more so what's included in this trip is also pretty unmatched. We've got flights and hotels, all of our on the ground transportation, breakfast and dinner daily, lunch around the go so much so that's where we get to kind of explore the local cuisine. Um, we have one personal tour director per bus who is with us 24-7 um, from the moment we arrive at the airport and they drop us off on our final day. We had skip the line passes to a ton of excursions, several guided tours, the list goes on and on um, including licensed local guides of some of the most historic and exciting places to visit. So um, before I move on to part two I am happy to take any questions or feedback on this trip before I start looking for approval for 2025? Anything? Okay. John Paul, do you have anything to say? No, just rewatching all the recaps and yeah. brought me back. <laughs> yeah. It was so awesome. Yeah. We, um, worth it. We have been working to try to come up with like a, a banquet format, but the end of the year is so crazy. We've got spring sports. So I think what we're going to settle on is trying to get approval for everybody to come back for a Spartan time to watch a bigger version of this slideshow and the video that Mr. Williams was compiling while we were on the trip. So we'll be able to have one last hurrah before you guys, before you guys leave us. <laughs> okay. I'm ready when you are, Vanna. <laughs> um, so again, this past fall, the school committee approved the 2024 destination just one week before I hope to reveal it to the class of 2024. I'm now back and trying to receive approval for the class of 2025 tonight rather than next fall to allow more time for planning behind the scenes, um, but also financial planning for families. If I can launch it a little bit earlier, that gives them another month to be able to make some, some payments. And we all know how crazy the end of August and beginning of September can be. So I think that's one less thing you have to have on your agenda this fall. Um, I again ask that we keep this location absolutely confidential until I'm able to roll it out to the class of 2025 next fall. So again, those wandering eyes, I'm watching you over there. Um, if you, well, I was gonna say, if it gets out, there's only a few people I can track it down to. But if you review the packets in front of you, um, the first, section is really our partnership with EF and all it has to offer. It tackles everything that's included in the trip from the logistical side of the insurance and the, the planning down to like the fun itinerary stuff. So um, page eight is probably where your curiosity is immediately peaking where it has the price details. Um, it is a similar range to the classes of 23 and 24 with the lovely slight jump of inflation that we have. 
The price is subject to change, but I do also want to acknowledge that we have opportunities we provide for students um, where they can receive up to $300 off for early enrollment and large group discounts. So they had to look up the price that is right now. They can't predict what the price is for 2026. So again, it is subject to change, but that's a ballpark um, figure that they're looking at. And the hope is upon approval, hopeful approval, um, we can roll out this location to juniors that first or second week of school. That way we can host that parent information night that much sooner to give them about 17 months or so um, to pay and fundraise for this trip. So I'm also ready for another round of questions if we'd like them. No questions? Sure. I have a question. So for the adults that go, um, is there an application process or is every adult welcome on the trip? So we prioritize students first because seating can be limited, um, but adults, adults that enroll are able to join as long as they're a parent or guardian of the student, um, and they go through a background screening process that is completely handled by EF and their um, outside partner. And so the total for adults is a little bit more than the total for the students. Which includes some of the prices for the background check in those, those areas. <clears throat> so all the chaperones pay in addition to their student? So chaperones are teachers and staff, um, and they are at a discounted rate because they're working for the majority of the trip. So chaperones go for a lower rate. And all of that's orchestrated by EF. I don't attempt to do any of the math. <laughs> English teacher full, through and through. So for the, for the chaperone piece, like, is that, is that opened up to all of like high school staff? So each year different high school teachers would be able to go? Yep, so, so we, we offer it out to any teachers. A bunch of them come to me. I don't even really need to send out an email. Um, we want to make sure that there are certain areas, like there is a commitment level leading up to the meetings. We want our chaperones to be able to attend um, after school and during Spartan time. Um, we also, I think from my experience this past year with Italy, I think it's helpful to have a couple repeats back to back. So um, Mrs. Pattershall and I were saying that we like the idea of one chaperone per bus having joined us last year so that we have one extra set of hands and eyes that have a little more familiarity. And then when we move to the next trip, it's another two. So it depends on if we can keep them coming back because it's certainly exhausting. Um, but there are no restrictions to which staff members are um, able to throw their, throw their hat in the ring to chaperone. Any other questions? I'll just, I have a comment, just um, thank you once again for doing this. And like I said, Haley, we know that we have you for a few more, th so thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's exciting. Yeah. And a lot of work and thank you for organizing. Absolutely. And bringing to Sanford. <laughs> it's gonna be hard not to say where it is. It's very exciting. You know, I've almost said it like three times. Right. I just keep changing Thank it you. to the location. I just have to say, we have this thing in my house where we play the animal guessing game during dinner, and we played it during Mother's Day, and everybody pretty much booed me off the table because I could not keep my mouth closed. As soon as I figured out the animal, I was like, oh, it's a bat! And they were all really mad at me. So thank you for reminding me yep. so not to say anything. The, yes, the we can just call it 2025 take this over here. <laughs> or the place. Right. Who would like to make a motion to allow the Sanford, Mar oh no, I'm sorry, woo, to approve the 2025 um, travel abroad? It isn't. I will make that motion. Wonderful. I will second it. Wonderful. All in favor? In favor. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate I'm your time. To second something. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kelly. Do you want and them Matt. back? I can take them if you don't trust yourselves or your children. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll trust you. Okay, moving on, RFQ, Shades for the Sanford High School. Okay, so um, we went out to bid for Shades for the Sanford High School. We had three bids come back. 
They range from Cheryl, can the, you say the shades for what? Can oh. you give a little background <laughs> for that? Um, we were looking for shades for multiple rooms in the high school to black out from people from seeing from the hallway in case of emergency again. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so uh, there was actually a map included and I had highlighted it and it had, I mean, I, I, I thought at first it was just gonna be like one little section and it's a, like intermittent, like um, it's different rooms because there's a, a big window that's looking out into the hallway or into um, where you can go look from the first floor up um, some of those rooms too. So there's, um, so we had, uh, I can't remember how many of them. There was like 25 different windows and we had all the um, different measurements in there. Some of them are small, some of them are much bigger. And so we went out to bid to get these lockdown shades so that we could keep our kids safe. So um, the we got three bids. Uh, we were a little worried when Steve and I went to go meet people on the day they could come do a walkthrough and nobody showed up. So I was beginning to wonder if we were going to get anybody. But we actually did get three bids. One was um, ranging from $6,826 up to $9,952. And so, um, you know, you always worry because there's a $3,000 variance from the lowest one up to the other two. But we actually had already purchased a lot of these products um, from Nightlock. We have them in CJL in some of the doors of a lot of our different schools. So we knew, and we had actually purchased one to see what it looked like in the bigger windows to make sure that we liked them. Um, and so um, we actually did, we felt like they're a good workmanship. They actually do what we want. They were easy to install. They were easy, so we didn't have to pay an installer to do it. So there was no additional cost. So all in th all, it was good to actually have um, tried those before, because I don't know, um, you know, how we would have felt otherwise. But the winning bid is for $6,826.25. So I am recommending that you approve um, to award a goods and services agreement to Taylor Brothers Nightlock for $6,826.25. I'll make that motion. Okay. I second. Seconded by Melissa. All in favor? All in favor. Thank you, Cheryl. Okay. And if anybody wants to see any of the full bids, so I have them with me, just in case. April financials. <laughs> so April financials, it's that time again. I feel like I was just here, which I actually actually was um, doing March. Uh, so um, right now we're um, $305,000 below budget on expenses and our revenue is coming in at a million dollars over prior year mostly due to subsidy. Uh, federal grants we have two million dollars worth of revenue so far this year and expenses at 1.8 million dollars. Um, our enterprise funds are actually um, right now revenue at $2.1 million and expense of $2.1 million, so right at break even. Um, ESSER is um, running at $3.8 million in revenue and $2.8 million in expenses. And our major grants, or some of our other major grants, we have $458,000 worth of revenue and $338,000 in expense. Um, and so then we go on to our articles of just how we pass our budgets. Um, right now, Article 1, which is all of our regular in instruction, is at $100,000 under budget. Um, Article 2 is actually $5,000 over budget, um, mostly due to uh, outside placements is what's causing that to go over budget. Uh, and if you remember last month, it looked like it was way over budget because we had the extra payroll last month. And so now you can see everything's kind of normalized again. So um, I forgot to mention that. Um, career and technical or Article 3 um, were about $50,000 under budget. 
Um, Article 4, again, about $50,000 below budget on Article 4. Uh, Article 5, which is uh, the student staff and support, is at about $170,000 below budget. Um, and it's just a little bit, I can't really tell you it's one item, it's just little pieces here and there um, to be pretty much. Uh, Article 6, which is your system administration, is about $13,000 under budget. Uh, school administration is about uh, 4000 over budget, um, but it's, I mean, it really, it's just probably a benefits um, really on that one. Um, transportation, this is the one where we haven't been running all of our runs, so we've actually had some savings of $235,000 year to date. Um, I think that's a little bit, um, I think it's uh, missing an actual invoice in there, so uh, due to timing, they're not real regular at sending their invoices lately, um, so it kind of jumps a little bit, about $50,000 in between each month. Uh, Article 9, I mean, I don't think you get any closer to budget as you can for $3,000 on that huge budget, <laughs> so we're right at budget. And then, of course, uh, debt service is right at zero dollars because we've actually made all of our payments for the year. Um, so we're actually at, um, that one's pretty well um, budgeted because it's dollar for dollar. We already know what our costs are. Article 11 is just about $2,000 under budget. And uh, so that's looking good. Um, I, this year, this month, I added uh, adult education on because I realized it wasn't showing up anywhere. So I figured we'd actually probably should show that. So I added um, adult education, and that's on running under budget 58000 That's mostly due to the way we had budgeted it because of um, the changes of um, being shared with Noble and stuff like that. Um, so... Um, and so that is the April financials. Okay, thank you, excuse me. Uh, recommendation to approve the April 2023 financials as presented. So moved. So moved by Kelly, seconded by? Seconded. Melissa, all in favor? All in favor, thank you. Okay, moving on, next item is old business. We've got nothing there. Uh, resignations and retirements. Sure, so some resignations. Amory Libby, second shift custodian at the middle school. Hunter Brannon as JV volleyball coach. Phil Amato as second shift custodian at Margaret Chase Smith School. Uh, Miranda uh, Levesque, SEAL team special education at the middle school grades five through eight at the end of the school year. Eileen Barrett, ELA teacher at the middle school, end of the school year. And then a retirement to announce uh, Donna Mishu, our human resources generalist for the district um, has let us know that she'll be retiring um, with that. So that's gonna be a big loss uh, for the Sanford School Department because Donna has done an, an excellent job uh, in that area for that. Okay, uh, oh, and I got a couple more on the next page. Oh. Uh, with that, we're gonna move, um, no. No, that's okay. Really oh, okay, nice. so next yeah. is staff appointments. Yeah, staff appointments, we got to move, uh, as we did for an adjustment, we're going to move David down later on here in the agenda. But I do, um, I want to appoint uh, Nicole Tibbetts as the head custodian at Margaret Chase Smith School um, starting next week. And Kristen Montesano, ed tech in the life skills room at Sanford Middle School. Stipends. Yep, so some stipends coming in. This is our summer programming. Uh, Title I summer school teachers and ed techs. For Title I summer school teachers, we have Bethany Combs, Kristen Curtis, Suzanne Gagnon, Gretchen Cornell Martin, um, Corinne Lachance, Stephanie Simpson, Jason Stone, David Walensky, and Kristen Wechter. You'll notice I didn't mention uh, Kimberly Joy because since we went to print, she has um, withdrawn with that, so I don't have her on this list. And then for our ed techs, Lakeisha Anderson, Ashley Goodyear, Connie Hand, Jenny McClendon, Laurel Muse, and um, Stacy Plant. 
And then I have a number of transfers to announce. Uh, Lisa Merlin is moving from um, Administrative Assistant Operations Manager at Community Adult Education. Sherry Tweedy from a 20-hour position to 25 hours at uh, SCAE. Val Sullivan from the SPE Librarian to the Elementary Distri District Librarian. Melissa Fagel from a Grade 1 ESSER position at Margaret Chase Smith School to a Pre-K teacher at Sanford Pride. Elizabeth Case from an ESSER kindergarten teacher to a pre-K teacher at Carl J. Lamb. Jesse Allaire from a school librarian at Margaret Chase Smith School to fourth grade teacher at MCS. Melissa Phillips from an ESSER district nurse position to the school nurse at Margaret Chase Smith School. Ethan Matthew from a science teacher ESSER position to a science teacher at Sanford High School. Dan Stefanillo uh, from a math Stanford middle school position to a middle school phys ed and health position. Jacob Mills from a ESSER sixth grade social studies position at the middle school to a social studies position at the high school. Rachel Gallagher from a kindergarten ed tech at Carl J. Lamb to title one teacher at Carl J. Lamb. And Sarah Mills, a first grade ed tech at MCS to a title one teacher at Sanford Pride Elementary. So, um, and what you'll notice there is what I like is we've hired ESSER positions, we've invested in these people, they've come and done a nice job for us, and then we've also been able to move them also into local positions as well. And then I do have uh, two nominations this evening. Um, first is Ryan Geary as a Sanford High School chorus teacher. That will be uh, starting for next year. And then uh, also uh, David Boger as a school nutrition program director district replacing Holly Hartley. David has joined us tonight and patiently waited as he's been able to uh, work through the agenda. But uh, before the school committee takes action, I'd like to have uh, David come up and introduce himself a little bit in terms of talking about his uh, background and uh, what he's looking forward to with the position. Push the, gotta push the green button. There you go. Hi everyone, <clears throat> I'm David Boger. I'm sitting here, um, I guess because I survived the grueling of the committee and from uh, Matt Nelson. But I'm really here because I want to feed kids. I want to feed kids real food. Um, I am a strong believer that if we're not gonna do that in schools, where the heck are we gonna do it? Um, it's a place of learning um, and it's a place that we can not only feed kids good school but we can teach them about where their food comes from we can teach them about nutrition um, we can take them to the local farm and uh, give them some exposure of why a tomato grown down the road is so much better than the tomato that you're going to get at the grocery store uh, i've been working in restaurants pretty much my entire working life um, I started flipping burgers at Wendy's when I was 16 years old, and I have just continued to cook, uh, wash dishes, busboy, bartender, uh, supervisor in restaurants from Portland and uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. I did a stint in St. Thomas Virgin Islands and Manhattan, and uh, back here to Portland where I spent 12 years at the Regency Hotel. Um, loved the restaurant business, but it just really wasn't enough for me. I wanted more. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to have some weekends off, that'd be nice, and some uh, holidays, but I really wanted to just feel a little bit better about what I was doing, and I searched long and hard for what I was going to do next, and after having a bachelor's degree and not doing a whole lot with it, I decided I wanted to get a hands-on degree, and I went back to school at uh, Southern Maine Community College, and I got a degree in dietetic technology, which is just a fancy way of saying nutrition. And it was there that I really fell in love with, uh, with school nutrition. I was able to intern in the South Portland schools under a great director there, Martha Spencer, and she really taught me the ins and outs of school nutrition. And I talk about that because, you know, it's experience I had before I got into the working world. And with that experience and, and helping out fill in here and there, I just had this sense of a purpose that I never had anywhere else. And uh, you know the expression, you find a job you like, you'll never work a day in your life. And that's something that I've kind of strived for and I, I feel like I found in school nutrition. Um, I worked 
I came right out of school and I, I, I started running a, um, a food program for really young kids, um, a multicultural uh, learning center in Portland. We fed uh, some 90 kids. I did it all by myself and I just learned a ton about what it takes to run a school, a school nutrition program or a federally and state funded feeding program. I absolutely loved that experience and I took it to Wyndham Schools where I was a uh, food service manager at the middle school for three years and within six months of being there we had COVID so I've learned so much about running uh, a food service program but also learned so much about what it takes to be a good leader and what it takes to work through such difficult times um, creating whole new feeding systems with remote meals and uh, satellite feeding sites I just learned a ton and I was very fortunate to work under <clears throat> Jeannie Riley there who's kind of well known in the school nutrition field and she was able to bring in chefs and kind of really elevate the program. Wyndham has one of the better programs in the state. <clears throat> I can say that from experience and I took that experience to try to get maybe one step closer to my eventual goal of becoming a director and currently I'm employed at uh, Old Orchard Beach Schools where I'm the chef and culinary supervisor there and I work as more of an administrative role and kind of as an assistant director. I'm a grant funded, uh, it's a grant funded position so it is temporary and that's why I'm sitting here in, in my next role. Um, I, I hope you all can tell that I'm passionate about this. This is something that as a lifelong goal of mine is to work in a community where I can feel like I'm making a difference. I absolutely love working in the school system. It's been great sitting back here and hearing all the different things that are going on here in Sanford and I am just really excited to be a part of the team here. I just have a great sense from this community. There's a big need and a big part of what I do feeding kids is to help fill that need in the community and I'm really honored and proud to be sitting here um, as your next school nutrition director here at Sanford, I hope. I am approved. Thank you. Thank you all. And welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody have anything they'd like to I'm excited. Welcome. We're all Thanks excited. Welcome. Yes. Well, let's yeah. let's let's make it official. Yeah, the recommendation is to accept the nominated <laughs> professional staff as I presented with one-year uh, probationary contracts. Make that recommendation. I'll second that. Any questions? All in favor? All in favor. Welcome. Yes. Well, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank Welcome you. and thank Good you for job. coming. Good job. Staying two hours. <laughs> right. <laughs> Policies and procedures. Okay. I have um, a number of policies for you this evening. Um, just uh, for the full school con committee to know, um, the policy committee has been meeting um, and we have been reviewing section A of our policy manual. And so that's why you see all the policies start with the same letter. So um, the following policy will be presented for first reading and that is policy AD and that is education educational philosophy or mission. Um, the updated policy outlines the overarching philosophy and mission of the Sanford School Department. Now, the next policies I have um, are policies that I'm recommending, that the committee is recommending uh, to be deleted. The first one is AFE, Evaluation of Instructional Programs. Policy AFE is an outdated policy in the policy manual. Um, if you look, policy IF, the curriculum development policy, it outlines a process for reviewing instructional programs as previously outlined in policy AFE. If you look at um, the next three policies, AFC1, evaluation of professional staff teachers, AFC2, evaluation of professional staff administrators, and AFD, evaluation of support staff, all three of those policies have been replaced and are now located in section G of our policy manual. Um, that, those three policies do need to be updated um, and we will look to do that to bring forward to you in September. Um, timing wise, it makes sense to talk about staff evaluation as we get the year going. Um, so we'll bring those forward to you. Um, but for now, looking to delete those other ones. Um, AFA, Evaluation of School Committee Operational Procedures. Policy AFA is also an outdated policy. The policy is not required by law, and this is covered by policies in Section B, um, the Board and Governance and Operations. And then for you tonight, I have the second reading of the policy we spoke about last meeting, policy ADAA, 
school system commitment to standard for ethical and responsible behavior. Um, the updated policy um, includes guidance for staff when revising consequences for violations of the student code of conduct that focus on positive interventions and the use of restorative practices. Um, with that, the last policy for second reading is ADF, School District Commitment to Learning Results. Um, and this policy was updated in March 2007. I suggested the change to make the report on the implementation of the learning results to the school committee on a yearly basis rather than quarterly. Um, this better aligns with our comprehensive needs assessment data that we report out to the school committee. And I make those recommendations to you. I'll make that motion. Kelly made the oh. motion. I will second that motion. Um, all in favor? All in favor. Recommendation to accept the first reading to delete policies AFE, AFC, AFC1, AFD, and AFA. I'll make that recommendation. Thank you, Kelly. Seconded. Looking for a second. Oh, Amy. <laughs> All in favor? All in favor. And last but not least, recommendation to accept the second reading of updated policy ADAA and ADF as presented. I'll make that recommendation. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Amy. All in favor? All in favor. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. No items for future agenda. Calendar announcements, Mr. Nelson. Sure. This Wednesday, we have the Health Occupations uh, Pinning Ceremony at Sanford Regional Technical Center. That'll take place at the Agora at uh, 5.15. And then, as already mentioned earlier, the This Is Us uh, Day is going to be at Sanford High School uh, this Friday. Uh, also mentioned the Vaping Tobacco Work Group group meeting on Tuesday, May 23rd at 2.30 right here in the Chambers. Our next policy committee meeting will be um, next Monday, the 22nd. We will have a ESSER advisory team meeting uh, also um, coming up on Thursday, May 26th. Uh, our two school committee meetings in June are going to be back to back. The first one will be Monday, June 5th, and then the week after, Monday, June 12th. And we're looking at... Um, Sanford High School graduation, it will take place on Wednesday, June 7th. Our last day of school is Tuesday, June 13th. As already mentioned, the school budget referendum is on June 13th, and the Sanford Community Adult graduation will be also on um, June 14th um, for that. Just a couple other reminders of the next Special Education Advisory Committee, May 24th. The uh, leadership team meeting for the month of May with the city has been rescheduled for this Thursday at 9 a.m. Uh, for that. And tomorrow night we have a middle school concert, spring concert for 7th and 8th grade uh, middle school students at the Performing Arts Center. Uh, we also uh, shared with the school committee invitations for the Carl J. Lamb Spring Art Nights that are scheduled mainly for this week. The SRTC recognition night is Wednesday, May 24th for that. So that's a lot going on as we come back to the end of the school year. Can I just add on June 9th um, is the eighth grade celebration dance, which is at 530. At the middle school for the eighth graders only. Friday, the, June 9th. Yeah, for the town Sanford Middle School. Okay. Yes. Yep. And it's only for eighth graders. Yes. Okay. All right. If we are all done, recommendation to adjourn this meeting at 7.57. I'll make that motion. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> I'll make the motion. Anybody second it? Amy seconds uh -huh. it. All in favor? All in favor. Just... Thank you for hanging in there. All right. <laughs>